unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grant the Masha, a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav. This is the very last episode of season four of Grant the Masha. In my opinion, we are ending with a very big bang. We are going to be coming back with new episodes for our fifth season starting in late January. My guest on the show today is Vinay Sitapati, political scientist and author of the blockbuster new book, Jugal Bandi, The BJP Before Modi. Many of you will already know Vinay from his previous book, Half Lion, which was an award-winning account of the life of former Prime Minister P.V. Narsimha Rao. Vinay's new book gives us the crucial backstory to understanding India's current political moment, and it is full of historical insights, colorful anecdotes, and a decent dash of insider gossip. I'm pleased to welcome Vinay to the podcast for the very first time. Vinay, congrats on the book. Thanks. Thanks, Milan. It really is a pleasure to be here. You know, uh, I want to start first by asking you about your previous book. Uh, your first book, Half Lion, uh, as I mentioned, was a political biography of former Congress Prime Minister Narsimha Rao. Uh, it was a big hit uh, across India and across the world, really. Um, we had the chance to talk about this book, I think, at, at Carnegie uh, shortly after it came out. At what point did you decide, you know what, I want to take up or I need to take up the question of the BJP's rise as the subject of my next book? Well, Milan, I... I'm 37, so I grew up in the 90s in Bombay in India. And I remember liberalization. I remember the opening of the Indian markets in the early 1990s. I remember standing in a very long line uh, for the first McDonald's to have like a Maharaja Mac. And in some sense, my first book was to ask the question, how did that happen? Right? So that was my childhood memory. It pushed me to think about liberalization. And then I said, look, we, you know, the, the politician at that time was Narsimha Rao. And I had studied enough to realize that that was a political story, that Maharaja Mac that I ate around 1995 was driven by politics. So I picked up this biography of Narsimha Rao, and that was the story. So once I finished that, I was thinking about the other big political change that happened in the 90s in India, which is the rise of the BJP, the slow decline of the Congress, uh, the emergence of the BJP as a stable competitor. So I spent some time thinking about whether I should do a biography of Atal Bihari Vajpayee, uh, the BJP's first prime minister. He was prime minister in 96, briefly, 98 for about a year, and then for five years between 99 and 2004. So that was what I went in um, going to do. But you're a scholar yourself, uh, Milan, and you know that you go in on a research subject with a hypothesis and then you realize that you didn't really know what you were talking about. And I realized that very quickly, um, that Vajpayee was only one half of the story, the other being the organizational man, uh, Lal Krishna Advani, who was eventually India's deputy prime minister during those five years in power. And once I began looking at these two and their story and the story of their teamwork, and that really is why my the Indian version of the book is titled Jugal Bandi, which is an Indian word, which is a musical concert played with different musical instruments. So they're not, it's not a duet. It's not the same musical instrument. And Vajpayee and Advani were quite different from each other. Uh, but it's also an equal music. It's not that one of them is an accompanist, the other is the, the main performer. So a musical concert with two people, both of them the main performers who typically play different instruments. That's a Jugal Bandi. And that was really the relationship I was interested in between Vajpayee and Advani. And as I got into that, Milan, I realized that really this story and this relationship between these two guys was a mirror to the larger rise of Hindu nationalism and the larger story of Hindu nationalism, which is why in some sense this book is about the BJP before Modi all the way from 1924 to 2004. So that's the, it was an organic evolution rather than a well thought out plan when I began writing the book. You know, as you say, you decided to tell the story specifically through the kind of intertwined lives of Vajpayee on the one hand and Advani on the other. Now, I remember meeting you uh, in the course of writing this book, we were having coffee in Washington, D.C., and, and you brought out the most impressive binder I think I've ever seen, which was a kind of color coded, you know, had dividers into different chapters. It was the most methodical process I think I've seen of, of someone in our field and you know, what's remarkable about this book in many ways is 
you are a political scientist, you're also a lawyer, you're a scholar, and so there's a lot of meat for people to grab onto, but you tell the story in a kind of very readable way, right? So it's, it, it's, it's, it's a, I, I think it's at this really nice nexus of kind of a, a trade publication, but one that has a lot of kind of research oomph. Uh, and I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the broader themes, but before I get there, you know, I'm thinking as a commercial proposition when you go to talk to your publisher, there must have been a lot of pressure to say, you know what, we still haven't had the great book on Narendra Modi and Amit Shah. Uh, was there pressure on you to kind of focus more on the contemporary period rather than looking in the rearview mirror? Well, so Milan, since you know me, you know well that I don't scoff at commercial considerations at all. <laughs> like I'm obsessed with readers. You know, I look at my Amazon sales numbers all the time and I'm not ashamed about it. Like why the hell did I spend three years doing this if people don't read the book, right? And some people think it's a shallow way to go about things, but you know what? I just don't care. At the same time, I have to ask myself, what do I bring to the table, right? I used to be a journalist in India. There are plenty of journalists who have written about Amit Shah and Modi and others who want to write and are going to write about it. What do I add? I add academic rigor. I did my PhD at Princeton, so I can look at data. I can look at archives. You know, I can just the scale of interviews, right? I did about 200 interviews for this book. Um, I must have read about 200 articles as well as a few books and um, none of this is helpful in understanding Amit Shah and Modi, at least for the next 15, 20 years. So I realized this, that I should do something that I add value as a scholar, while at the same time make it racy, masala, and, and intelligible. And to give you just one example, uh, a lot of people were happy to talk to me because Indian politicians only care about the next election, and Vajpayee and Advani are not electable anymore. Had I focused on Modi and Amit Shah, nobody would have spoken to me no party documents would have been available. Nobody would have had the guts to give me their private archives. I, you know, for example, I have the private archives of Vajpayee and Advani's lawyer, which is fantastic because lawyers write everything. I'm not going to get Amit Shah and Modi's lawyer to give me anything for the next 10, 15 years. More importantly, at a, at a, at a philosophical or a scholarly level, Milan, Amit Shah and Modi's story is still being told. We don't know where that will end. We don't know, is it permanent? You know, is it just a temporary? I mean, I don't think it's, uh, it's temporary, but maybe it is, right? So I have the benefit of some hindsight, which is where I think scholars kind of step in. Um, maybe what I'm doing is a little too early, which is why I rely a little more on newspapers and interviews, especially in the 2000s, right? From the 1920s, 30s, 40s, I can get archives. Um, but I do think that, and I realized this with the Nasima Rao book, you need 20, 30 years distance between the subjects that you're writing about for people to speak, for archives to be made available, and quite simply to be able to see the woods for the trees. So while you know I love commercial and, and sales considerations, I also know that what, what I should do that is different from so many journalists trying to write about today, looking just at today. You know, uh, before we get into the real heart of the book, um, you know, it occurs to me that many of our listeners started following Indian politics in 2014, or maybe with the UPA government, that um, th th they're young enough or new enough to the subject that, uh, you know, the 70s, 80s, 90s are kind of like ancient history to them. Um, I was wondering if we could start out by just having you kind of briefly sketch out you know, the book's two main protagonists. And, and let's start with Vajpayee. You know, you know, you note early in the book that, quote, Vajpayee's childhood was not swept up in the anti-British struggle. Instead, what kept him and Advani busy was involvement in a cultural organization, the RSS, which was expanding fast enough for the British to, at that point in time, contemplate a ban. Tell us a little bit about how Vajpayee enters the Hindu nationalist kind of movement and how that sort of shaped his life in the formative in his formative years. Well, so just to give you a brief sense to some of your listeners about why you should care about these two old guys, right? Uh, you know, how does it matter for the for the current movement? And in some sense, my book is an answer to the puzzle that unlike, say, Donald Trump or, you know, the Philippine president or the Brazilian president, Narendra Modi is not a whimsical man who wakes up and is driven by his own ego. He's an enormously disciplined man who is driven by politics that is 100 years in the making. So the Citizenship Amendment Act, um, you know, the, what he did with the, when it comes to special status to Kashmir, to just give you an example, has been in the party manifesto for the last 70 years. So that's why you should, you know, look at this 100-year history and the people who dominated much of these 100 years were Vajpayee and Advani, and they literally ran the party between them from basically 1968 
all the way to 2004, right? So that's why you should study the two of them. And I do have a bit about the young Amit Shah and Modi and what are their defining influences and why are their politics different from the Jugal Bandi or the duo of Vajpayee and Advani. So, but let me begin this story a little, you know, at the birth of Vajpayee and Advani, which is the 1920s. So to really understand them, you have to first understand the context in which they were born. And that context, Milan, is the introduction in a real sense of elections into India by the British. So the British were introducing elections in India in response to nationalistic pressure. They were limited elections. They had begun in the late 19th century. But 1920s is really the decade where Indians realized for the first time that one person, one vote, or the principle of one person, one vote is definitely going to decide power in the future. And as you know, Milan, and I've written about extensively, India is a group-based society. Caste, religion, region plays a very big role. I also know this plays a role, for example, race plays a role in the West. But Indian lives were and are entirely structured on the basis of groups. What lends fluidity and flexibility to Indian politics is the definition of the group changes. Sometimes you vote because you're a Hindu. Sometimes you vote because of your region. Sometimes you vote because of your caste, right? But it's still groups we're talking about, not individuals. So just imagine for a second that you are 100 years prior to today in India. And the British have introduced one person, one vote in a group-based society. And all of a sudden, Indians don't start voting according to their interests as individuals. Instead, groups begin to panic. If you, your group size is small, like in the case of Muslims, you begin to argue against one person, one vote. Whereas if you're a Hindu nationalist, um, you say we love elections. And why do we love elections? Because Hindus are at the time 75% of British India and now about 80%. What's the problem? We love elections. But the puzzle for us is making sure that India, India's you know, 80% Hindus who are divided into thousands of castes, sub-castes, languages, vote as one, right? In India, we have a word for it. It's called a vote bank. So to basically consolidate a Hindu social identity so that they vote according to one politically. And as you know, Milan, you're an expert at this. Um, to win an election in India, you don't need 50% of the vote. You need 30% of the vote. You need 25% of the vote. That's the 100-year project of, of the RSS, of the BJP. They're not fascists. They're majoritarians who are defined by elections. That's the context to see Vajpayee and to see Advani. Now, Vajpayee, um, as I mentioned in the book, um, is a Gangetic Brahmin. He uh, wears a sacred thread. He speaks Hindi. He knows a smattering of Marathi. And he enters Hindu nationalism for reasons of caste and for reasons of location, which is the princely state he grew up in was also Marathi speaking. And Marathi is the lingua franca, franca of the elite of the RSS or the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, which is the voluntary group that forms the underpinning of today's BJP, right? Um, so that's Vajpayee for you. Um, he eventually adopts the persona of a moderate or a liberal. I argue that there were two reasons for this. Um, reason one was that he becomes a parliamentarian at the age of 34 in 1957 and basically doesn't leave parliament for the next 50 years. More than what the party or the cadre thinks, he cares what parliament thinks, right? And parliament at that time is, is fashioned by the Nehruvian consensus, the original idea of India. And Vajpayee realizes that to mainstream Hindu nationalism, which has been rendered untouchable after the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi by a man who subscribed to Hindu nationalist belief, even though he didn't belong to the organization and the organization played no role, that was his job. Um, on the other hand, Advani comes from an English-speaking background like me, right? And um, he's a very rich man. Uh, he grow grows up in Karachi, which is a, um, a syncretic um, port city of the British Empire, exactly like Bombay. Uh, his strand of Hinduism is quite ecumenical. Uh, there are Sikh rituals um, practiced in his house. And his mother goes to a Sufi Muslim, Muslim shrine to pray. So he comes from a rich English-speaking class background and a strand of Hinduism, which is very different from Hindu nationalism, right? Why does a man like him join the RSS and Hindu nationalism? The answer is the division of India on the basis of religion in 1947. Overnight, his family is dispossessed. Karachi is now part of Pakistan. And the Hindu minority there are forced to leave. Um, and it's not just the fact that Advani's very rich family is, con is converted to poverty and he's forced to flee as a refugee. His own religious idea of Karachi and Sindh, his state, 
as central to the Indian imagination has been destroyed. So that's why these two unalike characters end up in, into Hindu nationalism and dominating it for the next 50 years. But, you know, it's not just about ideology, of course, although that's a major part of it. I mean, one of the most remarkable aspects of the book is the way in which you're able to bring out the relationship, the partnership between these two men, right? Uh, sometimes one takes the lead, the other takes the back seat. Sometimes it's flipped, or the other one holds the reins, and the and the other takes the back seat. You know, y- you recount um, in colorful detail the the first time Advani meets Vajpayee, and and he remarks that he saw something smoldering within Vajpayee. You know, the, the, he had a fire in his belly that produced an unmistakable glow. I think is the quote that you have. <laughs> Vajpayee, on the other hand, <laughs> doesn't recall that first meeting, it seems, uh, which must be something of a disappointment to Advani. But, you know, but, tell but, us but, a but, li- it's, but it's revealing nonetheless, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Tell us a little bit about the kind of yin and yang of this relationship, this, this kind of jugobandi, as you call it, right? How did they, these two men sort of complement one another in the actual practice of, you know, running a political party? So, you know, the Hindu nationalism requires this yin and yang because it's both a movement seeking to change society as well as a party seeking government. So it always needs a moderate organizer, uh, orator who appeals to parliament, as well as an organizer who can enthuse the, the cadre. And Vajpayee and Advani weren't the first in this. Uh, before that was Shama Prashad Mukherjee, the youngest vice chancellor of Calcutta University, um, basically an English speaking man uh, who becomes the face of Hindu nationalism in parliament, while the dhoti wearing Hindi speaking Dindya Lopadhyay is kind of, you know, the Watson to his Sherlock Holmes, if it were. And um, in that sense, Hindu nationalism knew it needed a Vajpayee and an Advani, right? So they, they knew that. But what is remarkable, Milan, about this relationship is how seamlessly they're able to switch roles. Between 1968 and in 1986, it's Vajpayee who heads the party and heads the movement. But in 1986, as Hindu nationalism moves in a more radical direction, the RSS orders Vajpayee to step down as party president. And Advani becomes the head and the face of the party from 1986 to 1995 as the party moves in a more extreme or radical direction. Once more, in 1995, when the party looks like with its striking distance of power, but needs to attract coalition allies and therefore moderate its image, Advani uh, steps down and wordlessly serves under Vajpayee, right? Um, Now, Milan, anyone who's been to India, anyone who's worked with Indians know one thing, that Indians tend to be prima donas, right? They find it very hard to work together in a team. You know, you put three Indians in a a room and they end up with four factions, right? That's that's the joke. (laughs) So this is, you know, many group-based societies have it. Indians are famously like that. And in that sense, um, you know, in India, we don't, I mean, this is true everywhere in the world, but Indians are very status and hierarchy, hierarchy conscious. So if you were once my junior and I was your senior, we don't like reporting to somebody who once reported to us. I mean, nobody likes it, but I think in America, it's a little more common. In the United States, in, in India, on, on the other hand, government servants will, will resign, right? If they've quote unquote been superseded by someone from a junior batch, right? You know this, Milan, this is the, this is the nature of India. In that scenario, um, a relationship that was able to, you know, move up and down and switch partnerships for the sake of this larger ideology, I found just remarkable. And it also gave me the clue to the larger point of why the BJP wins. Now, look, we've st- there are many reasons why the BJP wins, and I provide a causal explanation for the 1980s. But this book provides, I think, for the first time, a new explanation. Namely, they are obsessed with unity under any condition. Right. That's so. In that sense, Jugal Bandi or teamwork is the ideology of of the movement, um, and that's what I find remarkable about the BJP, exemplified by this particular partnership. So this oscillation between extremism and moderation, um, this yin and this yang, you said is kind of inbuilt into the BJP. You know, if you read the work of, say, Christophe Jaffrelo, right, the French political scientist, he he talks about this as well when he's uh, accounting for the rise of the BJP, but 
the, the we like to put people in bins, right? So the bin that we put Vajpayee in is he was the more palatable, moderate, quote unquote, mask is the term that's used for the BJP. But you also know in the book that Advani often wore a mask of his own. How so? Look, they needed somebody, you know, you needed a good cop and you needed a bad cop. And both of them knew that, right? And ironically, the social, the beginning of both of them were the opposite of the role they eventually played. You know, it, it, think about it. That's that's what's fascinating about that story. Now, there is some truth to the story where the mask long enough, the mask becomes your face. Vajpayee wa- had liberal instincts and Advani genuinely cared what the party cadre thought, what the RSS thought, more than what parliament thought, right? Um, but but in that sense, uh, they were wearers of mask, both, both of them. Getting back to the point you made a second ago about party unity, right? This is one of the big explanations in your book for why the BJP wins, and I think why political scientists will be mining your book for, for information about future work. You know, if you just fast forward a second to the present moment, there are a lot of people actually saying that um, the BJP is in danger, actually, of losing this party unity on two accounts. One is that they have put all their eggs in the Modi basket. And if Modi, for whatever reason, becomes unpopular, um, you could see a fragmentation. But there's a di- second reason, which is in its attempt, a successful attempt to expand its political footprint, it has started to incorporate castaways, poach people from other political parties who are not true believers in the RSS Sangh Parivar kind of Hindutva ideology. Uh, do you think, you know, if you just kind of hit pause on, on the history for a second and just think about the contemporary moment, that, that, that party unity looks or could look very different in a future BJP than, than where it looked in the past? I don't think so, Milan. Let's take your second argument of castaways. The Jansang and the BJP have been doing this for a really long time. Um, Jan- Jaswan Singh, former foreign and finance minister of India, was a castaway from the Swatantra party he joined. Um, Sikandar Bhak, the first Muslim face of the BJP, um, joined around 1980. Um, he was a castaway. Um, he was a castaway too. Um, you know, many of the allies like George Fernandez came, was a trade union leader who came from the political left. Yashwan Sinha during the Vajpayee era uh, was literally, you know, he was a finance minister during the Vajpayee era and he had literally been a finance minister in the previous Janta government, right? So the BJP needs castaways because it's pragmatic that you need them to win elections. But the core of the BJP, the core of the Jansang will always be people with an RSS connection and they'll never forget that, right? So they are very instrumental and cynical in taking some of these castaways and when time, you know, and they know that these people are not loyal to the ideology, you know, we need them, you know, it's a pact with the devil, but they've been making this electoral pact with the devil for a very long time, right? And look, to the extent that you have disunity, it's all these castaways who are disunited. Look today at all the former BJP leaders who are criticizing Narendra Modi. None of them come from an RSS background. Arun Shori, the former disinvestment minister, he's not from an RSS background. Yashwan Sinha, not from an RSS background. On the other hand, the two men who Baj- um, Modi has humiliated the most, Murli Manor Joshi and Lal Krishna Advani, right? have not muttered really a word against Modi. That's re- and, and that tells you something. Now, with regard to your first question about, you know, is does Modi threaten disunity? The argument I'm making is not that uh, there's something magical about the RSS that they don't attract um, egotists, right? I mean, Narendra Modi is Indian, you know, he drinks the same water as other Indians uh, who believe themselves as prima donors. But the question is, despite the fact that Modi is a bit solitary and a lone wolf, despite the fact that he's built a personality cult around him, right? And despite the fact that he's more popular than the party, the party uh, organization has not been destroyed. The RSS has not been swallowed, right? And you have leaders in today's BJP like Vasundhara Jaji Sindhya and the chief minister of Madhya Pradesh, Shivraj Singh Chauhan, neither of whom Modi particularly likes and were once competitors to Modi, who have a say in the organization. In contrast, if you look at the Congress party, you don't have anyone who doesn't swear absolute loyalty to Nehru Gandhi. So despite Modi's um, solitary personality, the BJP today continues to have more inner party democracy than most other political parties in India. And that's a triumph of the ideology of teamwork. 
I mean, just to to echo that point, I mean, you know, there were this uh, is this group of 23 Congress party uh, elites, right, who have come out, uh, issued a letter a few months ago, um, worrying about the future of the Congress. And we've seen how they've been both publicly and privately kind of uh, slapped down and marginalized in various ways. I want to kind of come back to the period of the 1980s, right? So uh, the BJP is born as a party uh, in 1980. Um, and they, this is, you know, taking place in the aftermath of the, the ill-fated junta government post the emergency. You credit Advani for steering the BJP in a new direction, uh, a direction that is more um, uh, aligned with a backward caste movement uh, more in favor of the Ram Temple in Ayodhya, uh, more in favor of, of, of even of liberalization. Uh, but you remind us that these weren't preordained changes in any way, right? Um, how did how, how did Advani come to shape the party uh, in that direction? And I'm wondering to what extent um, was this a, a, a kind of top-down effort at change versus being able to perceptively kind of read the ways in which politics was shifting around him uh, and quickly get in front of that tidal wave, as it were? So as you know, the book argues that it's the latter, that, you know, Advani was late to the party. And, you know, there's a there's a saying in, in, in India that I'll say it in Hindi and then I'll say it in English, which is Naya Naya Musalman Pancho Vak Namaz Karega, which is a new convert to Islam always prays five times, right? And Advani was a new convert to, Hin- to Hindutva in the late 1980s. So my story and where it departs from scholarship on Hindu nationalism begins in the early 1980s, Milan where I argue that the rise of the BJP or the rise of a Hindu vote bank was demand driven. It was there was Hindu anxiety in the air. And that Hindu anxiety was driven by three factors, three or four factors. One is the Khalistan or Sikh separatist movement who are targeting Hindus of all castes. Second was that the rise of OBC reservations or numerically mandated quotas in North India around that time, it had already happened in South India, which was creating panic among upper caste poor Hindu voters. And third is a fear that Saudi petrodollars is fueling conversions to Islam. And I would say fourth, the general deterioration in the economy, which was fueling not class fears, but ethnic fears, right? So you have this cauldron in the 1980s where you have Hindu anxiety. Vajpayee is still stuck in the, in the belief that like in the 1970s, in the 1980s itself, the way to mainstream the BJP is to work within the Nehruvian consensus and to stay away from the RSS. And he's wrong, again. I don't mean wrong for India. I mean wrong for Hindu nationalism and the BJP, right? To be clear, my job is not to take sides in this debate. Um, Advani realizes it much later. And as I argue in the book, the first group to see this was the RSS and the VHP. They begin to uh, to stroke Hindu anxiety. And the first political party to pander to this is is the Congress party, is not the BJP. And in some sense, the BJP adopts, for example, the Ayodhya movement, um, the uh, the desire to destroy the Babri Mosque and build a Hindu temple above it. Uh, four years after the Congress adopts it, nobody talks about that. The first communal party in India was the Congress, right? For crying out loud. And but there's 19- also the issue sorry. of uh, so just interject. You know, I mean, uh, this comes up uh, in, in in discussions about things like you know uh, the cow slaughter bans. And for yes. instance, if you look at where those were first enacted, they're by and large in Congress ruled states. Yeah, absolutely. You know, absolutely right. And you know, and in some sense, the BJP in the 80s is terrified that it's fashioning itself in this moderate image, but all the Hindu voters are going in the opposite direction because Vajpayee has descriptively completely misread the mood in the 1980s, which is a demand for radical Hindu politics. And by the time you enter uh, 1990, which is one of the 1990-91 to me, is are the two years that define India today, because they're the three big currents. And I have a chapter on that, which is backward caste reserve quotas, um, the Ayodhya movement or radical Hindu politics and economic liberalization or open markets, right? All of them taking place within basically a year of each other. Yeah, these um, are the, the three M's, Mandal, Masjid, and Market. Exactly, right? And it begins in August 1990 when the minority VP Singh government, um, with outside support of the BJP, announces um, quotas and central jobs for middle castes or backward castes, right? Um, and it creates fury among the poor upper caste voters who, are, who were the core vote base of the BJP. 
But Advani, who is at the time the president of the BJP, is smart enough to realize that if he opposes this, he risks alienating 40% or 45% of India who are OBCs, who are middle castes, right? And the BJP will then be condemned to be just a 20% of India um, uh, um, um, party. And you can never win with that. He knows that. So he immediately supports the Mandal Commission. Um, His core base of the BJP is furious, right? But that's what has held the BJP in good stead today, Milan. All the data which you're familiar with, many of which you create, shows you that the BJP is not an upper caste party anymore. It, you know, it gets a lot of middle caste votes, which is important to rule India. At the same time, a month after the announcement of the Mandal Commission report, he sets, he, you know, he gets on top of this Toyota convertible, which looks like an ancient Hindu chariot. And he rides from Somnath in Gujarat all the way to Ayodhya. He stopped in the middle um, to in, in order to create this mass movement to build the temple, right? Thereby diverting Hindu anxiety from cannibalizing each other to standing united against Muslims as the other. And he's successful. He's absolutely successful, right? So the two things that you see in the BJP of today, which is that it's a progressive Hindu party when it comes to pass, caste, but an exclusionary party when it comes to religion happens in those two months, right? And the third feature of the BJP happens soon after uh, when the Narsimara government decides to open up India's markets. The trader base of the BJP supports the, the removal of domestic restrictions on domestic entrepreneurs, but they don't want foreign competition. Um, but Advani sees the tide of history and pushes back against his own base to allow for multinational corporations to come to India. And I actually have private uh, uh, archives, I'm quite proud of that, of the meetings that happened immediately after. It's quite gossipy. So that's the part of my research that I love, which is you get this gold gold mine where people are also abusing each other, right? It's amazing, right? Um, but that tells you that Advani was go- could have gone differently. The BJP in that year, 1990-1999, basically between August 1990 to August 1991, could have become a party of only upper caste, in which case it could have never won anywhere in India. It could have become a party that rejected the uh, the um, uh, Ayodhya movement, in which case it wouldn't have been able to radicalize its own base. And it could have gone against economic liberalization. And that would have been a very different party from today. So while the book looks at these long durée forces like Hindu anxiety, changes in demographics, I think the journalist in me is alive to the fact that pivotal events and personalities at critical junctures do change the course of history. I mean, just to, to, to kind of finish the point, you know, you, you, you quote Arun Shori, uh, who is now not in the BJP's good books, but of course was very much part of the Vajpayee government, as saying that Advani was, quote, the second most powerful man in India. The most powerful man was the one who met him last, end yes, quote, yes. suggesting, right, that, that, that he, you didn't clearly know which side of the fence he was going to come down on, yes, right? Yes, yes. Well, no, um, Milan, I think, you know, because I spend a lot of time on these two personalities, Vajpayee and Advani, I, I ask myself, can I describe each of them in one word? One word. And with Vajpayee, I'd say charisma, right? Just raw Elvis Presley style charisma. Those of you who know Hindi, just go on YouTube and listen to his speeches. No Indian politician spoke with his mesmerizing quality. The defining feature of, of Advani was underconfidence. And I think it has to do with the trauma of partition. And the Arun Shori quote that you mentioned fits that, that, that bill very well. He was an underconfident man, not sure of his own ad- abilities, a Hamlet-like figure, right? To be or not to be if it were. Which is why it's even more surprising that he saw the arc of history in that one-year period between August 1990 and 91. Then sometimes Milan... The subjects you think you know very well surprise you. Sometimes your friends, your parents, your, you know, your significant others who you think you figured out, sometimes they surprise you. That's the beauty of human beings. They can't be reduced to arithmetic. So we talked a little bit about this issue of the three M's, and I want to ask you a bit about the market, the, the third M. You know, throughout the book, there is insight into the BJP's evolution on economics. At one point, you note the following, and I just want to read out a quote. The ease with which Hindu nationalists can spout opposing economics suggests they don't have a principled view on the subject. The deciding factor in choosing to not confront Indira Gandhi was an analysis of what it took to win elections. It was votes, not ideology or money, that shaped the Jun Sung's economics, end quote, of course, talking about an earlier era. 
it seems to me then, um, if we, again, bring your insights to the current day, that we should not at all be surprised by um, what some would argue resembles a kind of cognitive dissonance in the halls of power today, right? On the one hand, uh, there are some factions who would like greater liberalization more FDI would like to sign up to these mega regional trading agreements and others within the party and in the RSS who who feel quite torn, uh, who would like to see a doubling down on import substitution, uh, who would like to see greater tariff barriers, who would like to see um, reform of public sector uh, units rather than, um, you know, privatizing them. So, it seems like we've made as an analyst class a huge mistake in 2013, 2014, assuming things about what a Modi-led BJP would do that we shouldn't have known based on past history. Is that accurate? I think you're absolutely right. And here's the schizophrenia, right? Here's the inconsistency. On some things the Modi government does, they are remarkably consistent, right? So for example, they've been saying for the last 70 years that they'll get rid of special status when it comes to Kashmir, what do they do when they come in with a majority? They get, get rid of special status to Kashmir, right? From the 70s and the 80s itself, they've been talking about counting Indian citizens, um, giving uh, special citizenship to um, basically Hindus and non-Muslims from, um, from, from uh, countries that are close to India. What do they do when they come to power? You have the Citizenship Amendment Act and the NRC, right? These are ideological. I think the mistake analysts make is, to look at everything that Modi does through the prism of ideology. And that's a mistake for the following reason, which is that unlike other sort of, you can say, ethnic or religious movements, Hindu nationalism is based on Hinduism. And Hinduism has never had a theocratic bent of mind. It's never had a theory of the state. So if you ask the question, what is Hindu um, economics or what is Hindu foreign policy? The answer is there is none, because what makes Hinduism unique is that it doesn't have a central and authoritative institution, unlike the Vatican for the sake of Catholics. And it doesn't have a central authoritative book like the Quran is for Muslims, right? That's That for, the, for Hindu nationalism is the problem, which is that's why Hindus don't vote as one and they want to create a consolidated Hindu identity. On the other hand, the fact that there is no Hindu theocratic state has one very big implication for my book, which is that they are very comfortable with the democratic state. You know, they don't want, you know, some kind of Hindu Medina or some kind of Hindu caliphate or Hindu papal state because they don't have that resource in history to look at, right? Unlike many other religions, which have thought deeply about the relationship of the state and politics, Hindus and Hinduism has not. Um, as a consequence, one, they're comfortable with elections, especially because they're a social majority. And second, on issues that you and I, Milan, call governance, Hindu nationalism does not have an authoritative view. So when just take economics, right? In the 1970s, in the quote that you, uh, that you gave, the, uh, the, um, the Hindu nationalists are very happy supporting socialism, right? Um, but when Vajpayee comes to power between 1998 and uh, 2004, uh, the government he runs is widely seen as the most quote-unquote reformist in that it tried to you know, diminish the state from many areas of the economy. And now there you have Modi, who is a much more of a command and control economy guy, right, for good or for worse. That just shows that the answer to e Hindu nationalist economics does not lie in ideology. The, uh, and, and, and people do this. I mean, many people I respect are obsessed with finding some random text, you know, and saying that, look, there's a, you know, inkling of a foreign policy here. What that simply means is that you have Hindu nationalists over the last hundred years who've written books on Israel, on the United States, you know, on how to deal with the Muslim world. But that's just a big tent debate, right? That's not ideological. And my clue about this was in a conversation I had with Arun Shori, who was a very reformist disinvestment minister in the Vajpayee government, um, the 1998 to 2004 one. The RSS hated him. And the head of the RSS, K.S. Sudarshan, who was a, um, um, a socialist when it came to economics, constantly and publicly and, you know, if I may say, very un-Hindu nationalist-like manner, criticized Shauri and Vajpayee publicly. But he told me that when he met K.S. Sudarshan to, to argue back, K.S. Sudarshan never said, you know, look at this particular text in Hinduism. He didn't say any of that. He just said, I, Sudarshan, am a socialist and think what you're doing is against India, right? And that, it, it really strikes me that analysts must look at some things 
which are ideological about this government because Modi and Amit Shah are ideologues and are serious about it. But on 90% of things you and I call governance, the RSS gives them a free pass that when it comes to dealing with China, when it comes to demonetization, it's not that the head of the RSS is giving detailed instructions to Modi on what to do. I mean, j- just to amplify the point, I, I remember this was now uh, almost two years ago, listening to a senior member of the government talk about um, the the kind of economic reform program post the 2019 election. And, and, and what this um, official remarked was, I'm not sure uh, what's holding them back from doing more reform, right? You've won a unprecedented re-election. You now are approaching a majority in the Rajya Sabha. You've expanded your foothold across states. Narendra Modi is, you know, head and shoulders above any other politician in the country in terms of his popularity and charisma. Um, and, you know, that prompted after this statement, uh, a bunch of side discussions. And, and, and the thing that emerged for me after talking to a bunch of people, including people within the BJP, is that exactly as you point out, there is no social consensus within the party on economics as there is on other matters of culture and, and society and so on and so forth. And I think I think that shines through. You know, on the democracy point, Vinay, if I could just, you know, kind of go back to that for a second, you know, this is something you argue very powerfully in the book, but you've also highlighted it, previewed it in the pages of the Indian Express. I think you wrote an op-ed about this after the 2019 verdict, in which you take issue with scholars who portray the BJP and RSS as anti-democratic or quote-unquote fascists, because as you argue, they have fully bought into the logic of elections that squares with the the kind of social majority as well as the fact that there is no Hindu theocratic state. However, some might push back and say, you know, Vinay, that's a pretty low bar. Okay, they buy into elections, but do they buy into the logic of liberal democracy, which is really, you know, what's at stake in India? How, how would you re- react to that? Oh, I'd agree with them. They do not buy into the idea of liberal democracy. Um, and I'm, and, but there is a distinction between liberal democracy and democracy. And that, that kind of matters. The heart of democracy is free and fair elections. And if you take a Joseph Sumpeterian view, you just need, you know, the minimal additions to make sure democracy is truly, uh, elections are truly fair and uh, free and fair. The, um, you know, the opposition should have a level playing field, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, but other than that, you let's use the word democracy in a way in which you and I both agree. And then let's add constitutional democracy, liberal democracy. They're not liberals, right? And liberals define narrowly to mean, do they, is the unit for them individual and individual freedom? Of course not, right? It's a group-based ideology. But once again, anyone who studies Indian politics realizes that liberalism in India is even rarer than the Bengal tiger, right? It's very hard (laughs) to find it. Very, very hard to find it, you know, in a few patches of urban India and on the you know, op-ed pages of major newspapers, you will find somebody talking about individual freedom. But 99.99% of Indians, that doesn't constitute what they consider the good life. That's just, you know, I hope that changes. I, you know, I, I recognize that, you know, I'm a minority in this sense. But um, what makes, you know, the BJP is not unusual because every other party, and that's the point the book makes, that once the British introduce elections in India, everybody gets that the game is to expand your groups, group size to get a majority. That's the game, right? So you end up with, um, you know, and many parties try it. The communists, for example, um, say that, look, yes, India is an 80% Hindu majority country, but India is a 80% peasant and worker society, right? Kashi Ram, a genius, a genius of the same level of the RSS in their ability to understand Indian society in order to change it, says, you know what? India is an 80% non-upper caste society. It's a Bahujan society. These are all majoritarian ideas, right? And they're not liberal ideas. They aren't pre- premised on individual freedom, right? In the case of subaltern politics, individual freedom can sometimes be a byproduct, but that's not the core, core argument. Um, so the BJP is not very different. Where the BJP is different, as I point out in the book, is that it has the organization to see it through. That it realizes that to conjure up a majority, you need to also stick together as an organization. Otherwise, the constituent parts of your coalition will break up. I call it in the book Hindu Fevicol. Fevicol is uh, like in Americans say super glue. So Fevicol is a very popular super glue in India. So I say it because everyone intuitively understands what it is. I think for the US and UK edition of the book, I might just change it to super glue. Um, but that's the that's the key to their success. Um, 
Of course, they're not liberals, right? Where's the debate? But they're not fascist. They are majoritarian. And they're not conservative either. I spend a lot of time in the book showing you that Hindu nationalism is self-consciously against traditional Hinduism. It thinks of traditional Hinduism as weak as and this weakness as giving rise to invasions. It doesn't want to go back to some glorious Brahminic past at all. You know, this Hindu Rashtra, you know, which what opponents of Modi are terrified about and they imagine that it's some kind of fascist state that lies in the in the future. It doesn't. We're living in the Hindu Rashtra right now, which is a Hindu majority that is able to use um, the majority votes to create a state that represents the interests of one community. And it's perfectly compatible with constitutional democracy. So by saying that they are constitutional Democrats, I'm not giving them a pass, a free pass at all. I'm just saying, know your enemy if you don't like the BJP. And if those who hate Modi and want to defeat him, the only way to do that is on election day. Like It's not about writing outraged op-eds or, you know, like ganging up in universities and cancelling people. This is a movement that is obsessed with winning the next election. And Milan, you're a close observer of India. You know that in a Hyderabad municipal election that happened a few weeks ago, a municipal election is like, a you know, the lowest form of, of pol- lowest, I don't mean, I just mean in a geographic sense. You had like the all the top brass of the BJP going, right? What sense would that make if they have fascist intentions? Well, not only that, I mean, you know, the the, the, the BJP party president, J.P. Nanda, uh, just started, I think, uh, the, sort of a tour to kick off preparations for the 2024 elections, right? Where, you know, as I pointed out in Twitter and other places, the Congress is still not sure what hit them in 2014. So it just shows you the divergence between the two. Uh, uh, Vinay, let me, uh, as we... Yeah, and just to end that, Milan, what you just said, does it sound like this is somebody who wants to end elections? That, no, I think that's right. But uh, but I think, you know, I think there is a question for many Indians out there about um, what the future holds, right? So I think one of the provocative arguments you, you, you're making right now and you make it in the book is that in some sense, what the BJP represents um, is essentially a closer alignment, perhaps, with the leadership of the country and the median voter. Right. Uh, An alignment that in terms of language, in terms of caste, in terms of ideas about, you know, what's acceptable in a democracy and so on and so forth. I guess the question is, you know, if we're in that broad alignment now or realignment. Um, wh- what about the future? Because we've seen a progression, right? You note in your book that, you know, Vajpayee and Advani use dog whistles on religion when it suited them. You know, Modi and Shah have made elections explicitly about um, uh, Muslims and, and Pakistan. Vajpayee and Advani in the past ignored caste, right? Modi has catered to that at the most micro level. Uh, you know, where Vajpayee, Vajpayee and Advani emphasize teamwork, the collective, right? Modi is more of an egotist and he's focused more about himself ever since the 2002 Gujarat elections. So are we moving to a more extremist manifestation of the Hindu nationalist movement, right? I mean, many people say that the next iteration will be led by Amit Shah Yogi Adityanath, which, which looks very different from Vajpayee and Advani. Well, I would agree with that analysis in that it's much more unconstrained by the need to get coalition allies because they can, you know, they can come to power on their own. The, the bigger, biggest constraint during the Vajpayee Advani era was, and I write this in the book that in the 1970s, Vajpayee actually does a deal with the RSS that, look, the, we need to, you know, focus on ideology to get the, the, the core voter, but the, Hindu, the Hindus are generally moderates and they won't accept a radical party, right? And that has changed, there's no question. But just to complicate matters, as the BJP has been correctly criticized for, you know, not even dog whistling on, uh, against Muslims, but being direct about it, and there's no question. And I spend a lot of time in the book showing you that this is embedded in the DNA of Hindu nationalism. So, for example, at the creation of the RSS itself, the founder of the RSS notices that there's a local Muslim shrine uh, where Hindus also go to worship. And he doesn't like that, right? He wants the boundary between Hinduism and Islam to be clearly drawn, even though that's not reality. Tons of Muslim communities live a syncretic form of Hinduism and Islam. And the RSS doesn't like it. And that is exclusionary about them. But Milan, at the same time, the BJP and the RSS are the most progressive institution within Hinduism. Traditional Hinduism had contempt for someone like Narendra Modi, the poor son of a tea seller who belongs to a middle caste and OBC caste called Mod Ganchi. 
which is an oil presser caste, you know, he may not have been allowed into temples, right? Um, he, you know, he, he, he's very, he's the, he's the opposite of, of the structures of Brahminical Hinduism. But today, he is the face of Hindu nationalism. And Hindu nationalism is one of the few institutions within Hinduism, which allowed for social mobility for, lo- for lower castes like Narendra Modi. And today, Milan, we live in an India, which has a Dalit or a formerly untouchable president of the republic and a middle caste or OBC prime minister for the same time, at, you know, at the same time. Uh, historic. At the same time, we have absurd laws against something called love jihad. And for those of your listeners who don't know what it is, it's basically a deep, um, uh, um, the state interferes and questions when a Muslim man marries a Hindu woman, because there's an assumption of lack of consent, it is about the most illiberal thing you can get, right? But this is the same party that gives financial incentives when Brahmins marry Dalits, right? So you have to see, the, to understand the BJP, to understand why BJP wins, you have to see that it's this unusual mix of a deeply inclusionary and deeply progressive force, which is how 80% or nearly 80% of Indians see it, and a straight-up exclusionary force when it comes to religious minorities. And that's just the reality of the BJP. And if you don't see it, you'd never be able to defeat them. Let me just end, Vinay, with a final question, kind of touching back on this issue of ideology, right? As you mentioned, Hindu nationalism doesn't have a clear view on the state. There's no doctrinal underpinnings about what the state should should be. So whether it's governance, whether it's foreign policy, whether it's social welfare, you know, the ideology or the religion don't really come into play. Do you think, though, that could change, that we're seeing the outlines of what a Hindu nationalist governance structure could look like, which is premised on kind of, you know, a charismatic leader, centralized leadership, an erasure of federal differences, a creation of a kind of, you know, second uh, class kind of citizenship for, for religious minorities? Or do you think that it's not quite as organized as I'm making it out to be? Yeah, I would push back against that. I think what you're describing is Modi's Hindu nationalism, you know, who knows what 20 years look like. And, you know, I've studied 100 years of this movement to know that it's it's very subtle in responding to to the, to the Hindu voter, right? And as the Hindu voter changes, Hindu nationalism also changes. On the other hand, on some things, you're going to see even more of the same, which is, for example, things like the Citizenship Amendment Act. You're going to see more of that, you know? Um, you're going to see this, you know, because they're obsessed with demographics, right? In Hindi, it's called Ganit Shastra or Arithmetic. And I think the most honest way of describing um, the BJP's rela- relationship with democracy and elections is to see it as arithmetic. That's what they see it as, you know. And that's going to continue for a very, very long time. And, you know, you, you uh, and I just want to end with a joke, which is that, um, you know, I was, in this book, I have this story about the, the Jansung's march to parliament in the 1960s against cow slaughter. And I spoke to one of the organizers of this, um, this protest. And I said, look, you had this march to parliament. What was the purpose of the march to parliament? And, you know, this RSS man kind of looked at me shocked and said, the purpose was to get to parliament, you know, <laughs> and, it, it, and it, it really struck me that, that, you know, if you ask the BJP, what's the purpose of winning elections, they're going to look at you and say, well, it's to win the next election. And if you tell them, what's the purpose of winning the Bengal elections, we'll say, wait, we still have Tamil Nadu, right? And that's a long and deep project. My guest on the show today is Vinay Sitapati, professor of political science at Ashoka University and author of the brand new book, Jugal Bandi, The BJP Before Modi. It is a page turner um, full of uh, historical insights, uh, lots of insights about politics today. Vinay, congratulations on all the success you're having with this book. And thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you, Milan. Thank you. Grantham Asha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. This podcast is an HD Smartcast original and is available on hdsmartcast.com, India's fastest growing podcasting producing platform. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we referenced on this week's episode, visit our website, grantthamasha.com. Production assistance comes from Jonathan Kay, Tim Martin is our audio engineer, and Maya Krishna Rogers is our executive producer. Thanks for listening and see you next week. This was a Hindustan Times production brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast.